Yeah, we want to bring James Kogan in here. He is the, where are you, James? In Sydney, right? Uh, yes, so I'm in Sydney. And you are the, uh, what is your title again? I'm sorry, you're the ex president um, or executive? National Secretary of the National Socialist Secretary. Equality Party in Australia uh, and a correspondent for the World Socialist website. We love the signs you have behind your head as well. Well, that's obviously uh, uh, new posters we have issued uh, in the wake of the return to or the re imprisonment of Chelsea Manning. Uh, the cases of the two of Julian Assange and Chelsea Manning are clearly inextricably linked, uh, as you were just discussing. Um, you know, Chelsea Manning is back in a prison cell for refusing to take part in a sordid attempt by the American state to force her to give false testimony against Assange. And as you were just discussing, the, the sole aim being to try to get around the problem they've had since 2010, which is if you prosecute WikiLeaks for the publication of the damning information provided by Chelsea Manning, then uh, it raises the issue of the prosecution of the New York Times, The Guardian, La Paz, Le Monde, The Sydney Morning Herald, uh, and numerous other publications who uh, actively worked with WikiLeaks to prepare and publish the information in 2010. Uh, so, as you were just discussing, the clear intent is to instead try to prosecute Assange as essentially a, for obtaining the leaks for, you know, for conspiracy, in other words. Um, yeah, well, they, uh, he certainly did get classified information uh, that he was not authorized to have. That's a violation of a section of the Espionage Act, but as you point out, James, if the, it happens every day, pretty much hmm. in the New York Times and the well, that is journalism. That's the bread and butter of investigative journalism. Every major exposure which is being carried out of, of government criminality, of corporate criminality, and so on, has required the defiance of laws set up to protect the interest of government and big business. There are, you know, so. You know, the, uh, the efforts to criminalise independent media, independent journalism is proceeding apace. The statement that you played from the newly installed or upcoming uh, Ecuadorian US ambassador to Ecuador is chilling. Um, it, I mean, he made more or less a threat to that the Ecuadorian government, in it, you know, if the interest of the Ecuadorian government is to end the asylum of Julian Assange inside the London Embassy. I am deeply concerned about Julian Assange and WikiLeaks' hostile activities and intent to undermine U.S. democracy and national security. That's a problem, and letting it drag on much longer would continue to harm our interests, and I believe harm Ecuador's interests as well. In the fall, a number of additional restrictions were placed on him, including uh, restricting his access to the internet. He is still officially the publisher of WikiLeaks, and we still hold him responsible for what WikiLeaks does. It underscores what is at stake in the political campaign and fight that is being developed internationally, such as through this forum, such as through the rallies we just conducted in Australia, such as the rallies which are taking place now at American colleges and the event that you referred to, which is taking place, when, when is it? Tomorrow in Washington? Saturday. Uh, Saturday. Uh, yeah. But uh, so, yes, there are enormous questions at stake and it uh, again underscores the, just the utter complicity of so many organisations and individuals uh, who are refusing in the face of the I mean, all the attempts to say that the, the, the pursuit of Julian Assange was over the uh, suspicions raised by Swedish prosecutors or over something to do with the 2016 election, this is all just exposed as utter rubbish. You know, you know the entire pursuit of WikiLeaks, as that ambassador made clear, is bound up with what WikiLeaks published in 2010 and what he has published since. I mean, he didn't say it, but it was a fairly clear reference to Vote 7. Uh, and... The ongoing work of WikiLeaks uh, as one of the main repositories for uh, whistleblowers to get information out to the world. And there is nothing more important under conditions where uh, militarism is escalating, where geostrategic tensions are developing, where war threatens, where you have regime change operations being prepared, 
um, you know, there is nothing more important than whistleblowers being able to get information out to the working class, to the broad mass of the population, the, the, you know, the coordinated collaborative efforts to sort of develop, you know, a political campaign for, for Assange now clearly has to raise centrally the banner of, of Chelsea Manning as well. Um, as I said, their cases are inextricably linked. You cannot, you know, the uh, Manning has been told she will remain in a prison cell until the grand jury uh, ceases its its indictment, essentially, of, of Julian Assange. Or until she decides to testify. Which, yeah. As WikiLeaks tweeted, it's literally a coercive measure to force her to give testimony that she refused to do, uh, to give. Yeah, it's absolutely incredible. Finally, uh, we look to Venezuela, where Max Blumenthal, from writing for Grey Zone, in which we also republished at Consortium News, uh, refers to a September 2010 memo that happened to be published by WikiLeaks. And as Elizabeth was saying to me before we went on the air, uh, these documents that come out years ago can pop up in unusual ways and refer to a current situation, and that situation is Venezuela. This September 2010 memo, uh, Max Blumenthal writes, by a U.S.-funded soft power organization, that helped train Venezuelan coup leader Juan Guaido and his allies identifies the potential collapse of the country's electoral sector as, quote, a watershed event that, quote, would likely have the impact of galvanizing public unrest in a way that no opposition group could ever hope to generate. So this WikiLeaks published a document from 2010 shows that this group that was training Guaido had talked openly about the electricity of the country being shut down as a way to galvanize public unrest. Of course, as everyone knows, last week in Venezuela, about 80%, I believe, of the electricity went down. The, sorry, the Venezuelan government claims that it was indeed a cyber attack. They blamed the United States for this. Uh, they said they worked to restore the electricity and they, uh, they came under another attack. Of course, the United States denies this. In fact, Mike Pompeo, the Secretary of State, had a pretty awful tweet in which he said, uh, no electricity, no food, and soon no ma Maduro, I'm paraphrasing, but it was just a completely insensitive remark to make because people actually died as a result of that power failure. Yeah, and I, I think if, if WikiLeaks, I mean, as, as you, and, you and Joe were saying a few minutes ago, uh, you know, obtaining or uh, and having, you know, being in possession of, of secret classified information, which is illegal to technically deal, handle and deal with, is a mainstay of journalism. But the difference between WikiLeaks and something like the New York Times or The Guardian is that WikiLeaks has been so, um, you know, uniquely effective in its journalism that that's why we're facing this, you know, legal response to WikiLeaks that we have not seen and will not see uh, when it comes to something like what the New York Times publishes or the Guardian publishes on a regular basis. Yeah, that was the power of what was done in 2010. There was no attempt by WikiLeaks to vet it, to censor it, to edit it out. I mean, obviously they took you know, precautions about them you know, to the extent that was necessary, but they provided the raw data in the words of the US state agencies themselves, especially the diplomatic cables, which uh, had a transformative effect in world politics. You know, people were, you know, everyone's well aware in that sense of what, you know, that all sorts of sordid conspiracy goes on behind the scenes, but to actually have the have it in uh, black and white in the actual cables um, is, is a different matter. For example, in Australia, we were you know, very, very, from the outset, deeply, deeply uh, convinced that the US embassy had some sort of a role in the ousting of an elected prime minister. Uh, in December to November to December 2010, diplomatic cables were published, which proved it. You know, you know, the, a large section of the Labor Party in Australia are what were, were what were openly described as protected sources and operatives of the American embassy. And you know, similar revelations obviously uh, were made about uh, regarding dozens of countries, such as Tunisia uh, and, and like elsewhere. Yeah, no, I don't think you can emphasize enough the importance of the documents that Chelsea Manning was, you know, the source for the publication of, like the, the impact of the breadth of these cables cannot be underscored enough, really. Joe, did you want to add any thoughts on that? Um, if 
all one has to do is start reading all those cables. I mean, I was based at UN headquarters for a very long time, 25 years, and I was there when those diplomatic cables came out. There was quite a lot about the UN in there, particularly uh, the US was trying to get bio biometric data on Ban Ki-moon, who was the Secretary General at the time. So they were trying to get you know, skin scrapings or anything they could to get him. They wanted uh, this type of, of <laughs> spying was going on. Of course, everyone knows everyone spies on one another at the UN. But, and as James pointed out, a lot of times we know these things happen, but to actually have the proof is uh, invaluable. That's what WikiLeaks gives. So this was a huge issue at the UN. Um, uh, and the Susan Rice, who was the UN ambassador for the United States at the time, held a big uh, press conference in the auditorium at the UN, which is rare. Uh, and, uh, you know, I was telling her spokesperson that this leveled the playing ground between the press and governments. And of course, they uh, they had to get over that. And they did. That's the problem here. These revelations are powerful and they cause a stir and it's talked about. But the news cycle changes so quickly these days. Uh, for example, BuzzFeed had a ridiculous story a couple of months back uh, or that that Trump had told his lawyer Cohen to perjure himself in Congress. And um, Mueller's team actually came out and denied it, a rare statement from them saying it was not accurate. Well, they never retracted that story, just as The Guardian has not retracted the Paul Manafort story going in uh, allegedly to see Assange at the embassy, because they know within three or four days, everyone's talking about something else, and it's forgotten, and uh, although a lot of people are trying to keep the Guardian's feet to the fire on that one, but this environment of changing stories so quickly allows someone to make a huge mistake or put a full story out there, and it'll be remembered and not retracted, and I think that's why the existence of the documents that are online that could be easily searched by any researcher, a journalist, or a citizen, uh, it remains uh, so valuable, as we saw with this Venezuelan story, this 2010 uh, document that WikiLeaks published. You know, maybe no, no one would ever think they would see that again and would be relevant. And it's highly relevant in the events last week with this power outage in Venezuela. This is the value of WikiLeaks right there.